Hello, we are going to get started in two minutes. Um, there are files to be downloaded for today's session. So if you have time, I'm gonna go through the link. Um, there is one link providing the SRC file. It's from here. Um, we'll use this for today's hand on sections. Also for getting the entire SRC file from, from the Spinal Server Test CR data set, you can download all the files underneath. Those SRC files are after edit and top up. So you can save the time processing them. In today's session, I will start with reviewing last week's assignments, um, which would give a uh, recap of what pre-processing is, and then mention some uh, critical points, especially for quality control. Okay, let's get started. So last week we talked about um, diffusion of Mars signals. And the most important take home message is that there are artifacts and distortions. There are two types of um, signal quality problem that you have to pay attention to. One is the eddy distortion. Another one is the susceptibility artifact. And this still has to be corrected, um, but some of the protocol may not be able to offer you an opportunity. For example, for the susceptibility artifact is correction, you need to have two different phase encoding acquisition. A lot of data set, I would say more than 50% of the data set you have may not have this one. So if you don't have object um, direction of the phase encoding direction, then you could skip this one but for Eddy, that will be most important. And lastly, I forgot to mention that the FSL's Eddy program also offer motion cor correction as well as Eddy distortion. So you don't have to have a separate motion correction. You just need to use FSL's Eddy and then it handles Eddy distortion and also the motion artifacts. The reason is that both artifacts the motion will create like the displacement of the head position. That's similar to what eddy distortion is causing a problem, which is also kind of displacement. Um, both displacements are linear, so FSL's eddy could handle that. So the tech home message, you have to run eddy and top up. So the recommended, recommended step would be include these two, eddy and top up, and top up, requires you have opposite um, phase encoding direction. If you don't have it, skip it. And for ID, it's mostly applicable to most of the data set, but sometimes FS ID could be picky. Some conventional DTI or multi-shot acquisition, there are not they are not having enough sampling direction and ID will just report error. If that's the case, then this is still still offer motion corrections um, at the step T2, which I would briefly also go through today. Um, so the tech home is you have to go through th these two, unless there's a restriction, you cannot do so. So important things about the assignment last week is this is that there is a quality control step, which will be very useful when you are handle a large number of subject data and want to figure out where are those problematic data you need to uh, ignore or just drop them from the study or either having another way to for a correction. So the first step to download the data, you click the link and you point to an open neural. This website hosting a lot of open data sets is freely available. 
if you can go to the download link and click download, then you will ask for like a storage directory. So here to show an example of what it, it downloads. Usually it's just, like, just take like half an hour or one hour to download it. And the data will be stored in a standard format called the bits format. Bits formats include a specific tree structure allow us to easily share data. So for example, here the data, the subject ID will be the folder name. You see there's a, there are control subjects under those folder. There are also patients, the spinal cerebral test cell patients, there are nine of them. And in each folder, separate into section one, section two. So that means each subject goes through two separate scan. One is a baseline, another one maybe several months follow up. And for each of the section include anatomical scan, which having here the T1 and also the DWI. So the DWI here, BVL, BVAC, and Nifty file. And that's why we mentioned that last week about the input format. Just as we recap here, input format need to have the Nifty file, which is the DWI signals, and also the BVAL, BVAC, which is the gradient table. This will, are, those are the information we needed to convert it to the DSS Studio format, which is the SRC format. So once you download it, then the, the next step is to convert it to SRC file. Just as I mentioned here, now we are going to from here to here. And the step is recorded here. Step two, you can use a batch processing step B to A, Nifty file to SRC specifies bits format. So to do that, in DSS Studio, there's a tab including all the batch processing. And the function is located here. The data we downloaded are bits format of Nifty file. And we, need, we would like to convert those to the SRC file. If you click on this button, then you will be able to set that the folder. Then store those data you downloaded from Open Neural and just click OK. Once you click OK, you will ask for specify the output folder. So here I just create another folder and then name it as SRC because it's going to output SRC and then click set that folder. And DSS Studio will start processing all the data, passing them, generating SRC file. This step will take several minutes and then the file we got will be like this one. So you see, DSS Studio is not using the same tree structure, but for each scan, it stored an SRC file. For example, here, the subject control, subject one, session one, session two, the second control subject, also have two sections, store all of them into just one SRC file for one scan. So essentially those SRC file, each of the SRC file is kind of aggregating the nifty file and BVOP be back, make sure that it is correctly matched so it won't be confused or like mismatched in, in the following analysis. Then one critical step here before further pre-processing is to have a quality control. So step number three, we need to run a quality control. So this step allows you to figure out which data set is having a problem. And this step is very critical. The function is located in the first tab, diffusion MR analysis, step T1A, quality control. You need to set it a directory or SLC file and DSS do a wrong quality check. So click on it and set that the folder which will have all the SRC files stored within and set that it. You see here, this is studio, stop processing, checking each of the SRC file. So make, make sure that only the SRC file is stored in the folder because it won't check the Nifty file. You just ignore those. 
Once this is done, DSS Studio will output, generate a report. And here you could just save it to a new test file. So from here, I save a report as report.tst. And this report, you could open it in the cell. You would look like this one. So let me explain. I see a chat that mentioned about every time you get different result. Um, it seems that there is a bug or a problem. I can check it in detail after a workshop. Um, or you can provide me like a sample data set. So once you get a, the report is a test file, including each of the file name from the SRC. So important things, first step, you need to check the consistency. So this will be the simplest first uh, criteria. You need to make sure that all the acquisitions are consistent. So it happens all the time. For example, here, you see there is one scan just having only, only 12 DWI, whereas other is just having 16. So this one, well, you may need to drop it because the DWI kind of like stop or terminate the halfway. This one could be a little bit problematic, um, but still seems okay. Not sure why it's like uh, having a different resolution, but this is very common for all the study involved. Nearly there will be just one or two or even out to several of scan just not having consistent configuration. So the first four columns allow you to check whether all the acquisition protocol are consistent or not. So this would be for checking the consistency. And the following one is also important, which is we call it neighboring data correlation. So this value will be lower if there are motion, if there are strong eddy current artifacts or either there's or signal dropout. So higher value, the better, low value, the worse. So it's between zero and one. As you can see here, most of the values are very, very good, but here DSS Studio will run an outlier detector and point you where our outlier are. So as you see here, this scan which has a very low and neighboring DWI correlation and DC and DC value is much lower. So we may consider dropping this subject or this subject. So th those are the results from the outlier detection. Sometimes we'll look at number of uh, signal dropout slides. We call the best slides here, but usually this is not very helpful in, in practice, but most helpful will be checking this neighboring DWI correlation. So, and always we will have a check before pre-processing. So that means when we get those data from the scanner, we compile it as an as SRC file and then run this quality check to make sure that if there's anything we need, any data set we, we need to drop, for example, those with the lower number of DWI acquisition, then we would process like top up eddy um, to correct those eddy current artifact and then run the quality control again. So the second tab here, I showed a report after AD. So this data set doesn't have opposite phase encoding, so we cannot run top up, but we could still run AD correction here. And you can see here after AD corrections, the NTC value are most, most of them are higher than previous one, meaning that the correction is doing a good job before the pre-processing, before the AD, some may be like 0 0.7, 0 0.79, but after then, both of them, this like increased to more than 0 0.8. Still, there are still some outlier. For example, this scan, even though it's increased from, I would say 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So this there's a could be still usable, but the, the correction, the, outlier detection still point out there's a problem. So you may still consider to drop it or either just accept it. So I see a question here, how does the DSS do decide to call a low quality outlier? It's based on this value. So the way it works is like this, you would use this as a distribution and then calculate something called median deviation 
Um, the media deviation more than three, usually we call it an outlier. And this routine is the same as a MEDDEP. So MEDDEP has an outlier detection function. If you input this value into that detection function, then it would tell you which values are outliers. So it's the same. So, uh, and the calculation is very straightforward. So yes, it's not a universal threshold. It's like consider the whole distribution. So you need to have all subjects that are coming in and then run through this outlier detection. And all, sometimes what we're what we going to do is that we will specifically check each of the low quality outlier and see what the problem is. So what we could do is in step T2, the construction, and then open those with a problem. For example, the subject as uh, patient number one, scan two, then we could see what's the problem before the scan. For this scan. So as you can see here, we could go through here. You see there's a strong movement. That's why the NTC is reporting a problem. Also in the session slides, there are signal dropout. So always, I mentioned that come with motion, it always comes with a like, slice dropout. Those also decrease the NTC value. So you can find here, because wow, it's such a move a lot. And then you can make a comparison. How, how does it look like after Eddie? So the, the one after Eddie is here. So you see that the Eddie tried to move those from position back to his location, but you can still see that there's some remaining problem. So you can see the strip here. So the original slice of orientation, like this direction, you can still see the signal drop out. Those are the information that cannot be recovered. So this sub subject also reported by the assessor to be an outlier. So let me see the check. Um, I, I opened this one. So the another one is only have 12 DWI. This one may also be a problem. Usually this happens when uh, maybe a subject didn't tolerate the scan. So the scan terminate prematurely and then the scanner still output some data. Um, that happens all the time. Um, so this will be the case that you, even you don't need to look at the outlier, I would just drop it because it is the consistency issue. So the, these two maybe drop it, considering that. But this the the situation it depends. Sometimes you may just accept all of them, or either you just very strict in dropping those problematic data set. So I see a question: If the original cohort has four layer to processing the whole, yes, I, I would just goes through pre-processing of all the data set. And then before and after run the quality control report and make a comparison and decision. Oh, most of the time after AD and top up apply to all data set. If there are still outlier coming out, just drop them. So that's the most important step in last week's part. Um, compare it and then decide, make a decision where to drop those subjects. And in today's course, we are going to move forward. So as I mentioned, what now we have go through the pre-processing type of eddy, then the next step is how to process or model those diffusion MI data to get matrices, a anisotropy, diffusivity, and also fiber orientations. So here, in the table, I listed several popular methods to uh, use quite a lot today. Um, just that you know, this one is not a complete list. Um, as far as I know, there, there could be the hundreds of different modeling methods um, in the diffusion MR communities. And I just um, picked some of them that's used quite a lot um, depending on the publication. So this publication, um, get from the Google Scholar. So for example, you could check how many are using DTI, how many are using DKI. But for those methods to 
we could categorize it into three different um, processing approach. The first one is model-based um, and the representative method is DTI. So DTI is modeling diffusion with a tensor model. So it's called diffusion tensor imaging. And also there are model-free. Model-free means there's we are not using any model. It's more like a non-parametric way. It's like getting a histogram. So we call it model-free. Um, also, people also call it Q-space imaging. And still another one is very popular. It's called spherical deconvolution. So it's combining model-free and model-based. But so it based on a model, which is called a response function. So the way it works is that like you would select like Cope's callosum or certain voxels with single fiber and use those uh, diffusion distribution as a model. So it's a data-driven model to improve or to model the orientation of fibers. So I see the question, of which one is better for the animal study? I would say for, for animal study, most transient part is the SNR. So you, you would need the, the, the methods they, uh, that is robust to low SNR condition. So DTI is pretty robust. Model-free methods, most of them are pretty robust, um, but you would, need to, you would need to avoid complicated modeling because a lot of time you would end up with fitting noise instead of fitting signals. So I would say there's no clear color which is good for the animal study, uh, which is not. That's one thing. And the second, you need to consider where, whether you are doing like in vivo scan or is vivo scan. So in vivo and is vivo diffusion signals are very different. Um, and can, the, is, my experience is like, you would need to test as many models as possible and then see which one give you the best result. So see here, another question is, so can DSI do hardy tractography? Well, the DSI is um, a processing or modeling approach, but hardy, the original term referred with cubo imaging, which means it only has one B value at multiple directions. So the answer is no. So hardy here is not a processing approach. It's a acquisition with only one B value, but multiple directions. Uh, it's specifically designed for cubo imaging, but could also be used by GQI and other methods. So one thing here is a three different category to understand it. So the icon here kind of showing the general idea. So the model base is that you have a, a, a distribution of diffusion and you want to model it with a, uh, a numerical distribution. For example, for DTI, you could view it as modeling with a Gaussian distribution. Say, for example, you, you have the score of, of, of uh, from a test with several students and some maybe having a uh, better score, higher value, and you can calculate the standard deviation, you can calculate the mean and all of then it's similar to modeling with a Gaussian distribution. So that it allow you to get um, general idea of the distribution by those by modeling the with a distribution. So DTI we mentioned is like is a is a Gaussian model, and DKI consider not just Gaussian but also non Gaussian Gaussian part, which is the ketosis. And for naughty and ball and stick model. These two models are I call it the more is called is more like a composite model. For example, the ball stick model is in fact like multiple tensor, but the tensor has some restriction. So one is isotropic, another is purely anisotropic. Not the e, then it has a, also isotropic part, but there's another one for an isotropy. So for all modeling methods, the processing paradigm is you define a distribution and you fit data with a distribution. The good things is that usually for model-based methods it's very robust to SNR, but if the model getting more complicated and if your data is not conforming to that model, then the fitting may go um, give you some result that's biased. For example, if your data is not Gaussian 
or is the data is mixed Gaussian and you just fit it with just one Gaussian distribution, there will be model mismatch. And the parameter you get from model fitting would be biased. So that's why we, we mentioned there's a lot of paper mentioned about the limitation of DTI because it's assuming single Gaussian distribution in the 3D space. But in fact, a lot of data we got would be like two Gaussian mixture together or even multiple Gaussian. So that's a limitation of, of the model based methods. So there's another domain say, like, well, if there is restriction of a model, why don't we just get like a histogram? So the model free is like we got a histogram and then you get the overview. Um, so that's the idea of model free imaging. And there are three methods, not um, for example, there's a diffusion spectrum imaging, but this one requires a specific arrangement of the B value and B vector. So it's very restricted in terms of what position you, you need to have. Similarly, the cubome imaging also have restriction on the B value. It only need to, you only, can only apply to one B value and you need to have enough uh, orientation. And the one provided in this DSS studio, the GQI and QSDR try to break this limit. So it's, it could be applicable for a variety of acquisition, including the original DSI, or the Hardy that's for cubo imaging or the multi shell. So for all kinds of most uh, available diffusion acquisition, we could just construct it with GQI and QSDR and get a similar result of DSI and GQI. So for the Q space imaging of found or free, most of the time I would just use GQI or QSDR because you get similar results but break the limit of acquisition. And the difference between GQI and QSDR is one we construct in the native space, another one we construct in the template space, which is the MNI space. So is these two only differ in the space to be reconstructed uh, reconstructed. For spherical deconvolution, I also recommend you give it a try. So the the, the flagship tool is the MR Trick 3. It's a very, also a very good tool. I use it in some of my um, publication. Um, the strength of it is it has a very sensitive uh, multi-fiber resolving power. So I would I would say that here you could give it a two star. If you need to resolve very fine or minor crossing, then spherical deconvolution is your choice. Um, but if you just want to you just look at the major fiber tracks, most of the major fiber track, you could still get reliable results with, with most of the other, other methods. Spherical convolution is like mostly emphasize resolving multiple um, crossing fiber, branching fiber, all the things. For each of the methods, it provides different metrics. For the spherical deconvolution, it provides FD. For others, and they could provide also all different kinds of matrices. I would say there's a, a, a lot of different matrices, which I will mention and explain in each of them later on. So I see the question to use QA as a matrix of interest. Does it have to, to be multi-shell data set? Okay. okay, so the here is GQI can be applied to different acquisition. So acquisition here could be one B value, two B value, three or more, or multiple or like 20 B value. So the QA here you got from GQI would reflect your acquisition. So for example, if you just have one B value, one B value means you only detect a specific bandwidth on diffusion. So that means the restricted diffusion and non-restricted diffusion mixture together. Um, and if you have more high B value, that means the QA here is more sensitive to more restricted diffusion. And on the other hand, if you have just one B value, or either your B value is much lower, the bandwidth that being sent here geared toward non-distributed diffusion. So there is a it really depends on your acquisition scheme and the Q the QA would reflect according to that. So I'll explain more about the metrics here. So let's get on the hands-on session, how to get the 
the three methods provided in DSS Studio, which is DTI, GQ, and QSDR. And you could download a file here. It's just an SRC file. You go to the link and you can download this one, the SRC. So the one downloaded will be like this one. It's an SRC file. Then we'll go through DTI processing, GQI, and QSDR to get three separate FIT file. So the way to do it, go to step T2 reconstruction and open this SRC file, or you can just direct it and into DSS Studio. Then here comes the interface of step T2. And I'd like to mention that there are several functions on the top of it, which will be used for, especially for animal scan. You will need to flip or swap to the orientation that's the same as the template. And what's it already, the default orientation for the animal mentioned in the documentation, you can check it out, but that's one key important step. In human scan, mostly we will scan at the SL direction, so we don't have to flip the volume. The default setting should be good for most of the cases, but it happens when that if you go to the right, but the slice is not going to the top, then you need to flip the Z direction. So usually you need to go, go to the left, you go to the brain base, and slide to the right, you have to go to the top of the brain. Make sure that this orientation is right, otherwise a lot of um, template function may not be action correctly. So make sure that the mess is okay. And then you can set that the construction method. So here, if you set a DTI, then you just get DTI model. So it's just click run the construction and then generate a fit file for DTI. And you click each of them, and then you, you will get each um, fit file for different methods here. As I mentioned, GQI and DTI both be constructed to a native space, that's subject space. QSDR would, would apply normalization and then reconstruct data to the template space. For stage two AES, most of the time it's just like assign the default mask should be good, but sometimes it's not, if not, it's not good enough, you can change it here. So what I did is I click on the edit button and there are several functions coming now. You can open a mask for other tool or either you can just set it a stretch holding. So here I, what I specifically doing here is I, I just relax all the mask to cover the entire background. Here I just want to show you that how the background looks like comparing the GQI, DTI and QSDR for comparison. So if you see, if you find the mask is not good enough, then you may consider just editing here, but they're only provided limited function. But for most of the time, if you use GQI, you can just go ahead and then use a threshold of zero and then to cover the, the, um, the entire space, it also be fine. So the benefit of reconstruction in the template space for QSDR is for good comparison. So it, we would, it would make good comparison much easier because of each vessels are aligned all together. There are also several functions on the top. You can save SRC back to um, the 4D NFT. And you can edit this image volume. Some may be very useful. It's very simple to astrotropic. Sometimes you may have a position that is not astrotropic. So for example, this, this spinal cerebral ataxia data set, it also has a thicker slice. So the SRC file we downloaded, I actually resample it to two millimeter isotropic. So this step, this function used quite a lot. And also there are functions that you can crop, the, reduce the background image volume. So you will have a smaller file size or either just erase the background signal based on the mask. Sometimes may use it, but not, not a lot. You can also change or flip the B table here. Um, if you know that the B table being flipped, you found that fiber tracking is uh, giving interesting weird results, then consider flipping it. 
And the correction we mentioned last week about the pre-processing here. So a lot, a lot of time what I did is I, I would run the, the correction and then save it as a new SLC file. But here we just go straight. This file already goes through the uh, AD and Tabla. Let me see the questions. Um, as long as the in, cover the white matter area is okay. Yes, for GQI, and I was I was explain why that is. For DTI, the mask is important, but for GQI, it doesn't matter. And if you have a mask generated from SPM or other tool, you, you can just you can load it here. In command line, there's also an option you can load it in. So if you have a mask, I will also recommend you use it. So when you open a QSDR, there will be an output resolution. So there's a potential you could have a super resolution reconstruction. Um, but the default will be the resolution that's the same as acquisition. So higher resolution, uh, sometimes may be helpful, sometimes may not because it's interpolate the signals. Um, most of the time just stay the same. Also for GQ and QSDR, there is an interesting, interesting parameter here. So this parameter for most of the human scan, you would be like a one, around one or 1.2. And if you have less sampling direction, you may need to, you may consider lowering it. And the way to decide which one is the optimal is you look at the fiber tracking results or look at whether it resolves enough crossing fiber. Higher value will be more sensitive to noise. Lower value will be robust to noise. So this parameter is serving like a control of the sensitivity to restrict diffusion in GQ and QSDR. Higher value will be more sensitive, lower maybe not sensitive. For animal scans, usually this value will be lower. For its vivo, this will be reduced by half, like 0.6. So let's check out the, the feed file we generated. So remember when I generate this feed file, I can. I can open it in step T3, just like we probably did in the course like first or second week, or I can just drag it in. And when I create this fit file, I intentionally to dilate the mask. And that's why I say mask is important for DTI. So you see here, this mask shows the anisotropy. And the background is like giving a lot of high speckle noise, meaning that the model fitting is not good. So one important thing about diffusion tensor is that like it doesn't really work well if the, the signal is all very low, such as the background, which is just a noise. It's not very good against background noise. So that's why most tools would require to have a good mask. Otherwise, you would, need, you would get this ugly result and it would run fiber tracking. Then it would be a chaotic condition like this one. Similarly, if you look at other things like mean diffusivity, you also having a lot of noise. So that means the, the, the model fitting is not good if around background. So that's DTI. And the GQI is, that is more robust to noise. So here, even though I use the same mask to create, you see that it's clean background. And the source of it, you see here, when I go through the back, here there's a QF value showing up. So here is a higher QF 0.6. When you go to the background, it's still not zero, meaning that it's still within the mask, but it's dropping to very low. So that's why that in DSS Studio, if you just choose GQI, which I would recommend is that you don't really care about the mask and they still get, get nice decent results using covering the whole space. It doesn't have the restriction of this model that will be violated and give you problem. Um, so it's cleaner image so you can compare this and the map with the one in in DTI, then you, you will see that the difference in that. So especially in the background, and sometimes when you get close to the gray matter or either your SNR is not getting good, so you hear the speckle here, you see the speckle there. Some of them may be due to the model fitting problem as a as SNR dropping, then it's not getting good. 
So you can then strip the skull for DTI may be helpful to get rid of it. So skull drip stripping is, is that you, you just get rid of the background signal. So get you a cleaner result, but for GQI, it doesn't matter. It's also dropping very low. So if you want to do the skull stripping, then to do it in DSS Studio is like, once you define those masks, you see here is still background, a little bit background signal, and you can just erase it. So I can erase background signal. So you would zero all the background. And then when you select DTI, then we'll get you clean results. You may say, well, why does it matter? You still get a result, but sometimes the mask doesn't go as good or whether the image quality or the geometry doesn't give you a good mask. And even with skull stripping, you could still see some speckle coming out near the gray matter. And de depending on the tool you use, some may be more robust to this kind of poor model fitting, some may not. And this may get could give you a hard time. Like if you are like analyzing a track going here, there's a high FA value coming up, but I don't think this is one is for real. This may be like it's just due to model violation. So the answer is well, if you use GQI, then you don't really need this to street the score. So let's um, look deeper into the matrices. I mentioned there's a list of matrices and how could we categorize them? So similarly, as I, we categorize diffusion methods into model base, model free, then for all the methods, we can just flow in each method, we can just categorize them into each category. The matrices could also be understand in three different ways. So there's, there are three major type of matrices or the, the biological condition we could detect using diffusion MRI. So here just using DTI as an example. So the first row list the biological condition. First one is free water, for example, in a ventricle or either there's a huge edematous regions. There are free water going freely everywhere. This first condition. Second is restricted condition, but it's isotropic. For example, in a gray matter, there's a lot of cell, or either in a tumor cell, there there is just tumor cell like restricting all the water content within. So this is still diffusion, but being restricted. It's isotropic but restricted. Free water is isotropic but not restricted. Then the third so one is anisotropic. That means it's restricted in certain orientation, but free, more free in certain orientation. So we call it is anisotropic. And in the tensor model, the first one, the diffusivity will be high at all different orientations. So the diffusion tensor will be high value at all the direction, S, Y, Z. And for restricted, that means the, the diffusion will be lower at all different orientation because it's being isotropically restricted. And the third one, and the source of B means higher in one direction and lower in another one. So let's take a look of the DTI and then see how it looks like. FA, you could imagine you could you could view it as a ratio of to tell you the anisotropy. So it's the value range between zero and one. One means that it's purely anisotropic. So diffusivity will be high in the fiber orientation, low in the cross-sectional direction of the fibers. And usually the value is, will be higher in the white matter because like those structure are fibrous structure which will have axonal fibers that freely diffuse along the, those directions, but restricted in the perpendicular direction. And the SO diffusivity means that diffusivity along the fiber orientation, but it will be also higher in the ventricle. And compared with the radio diffusivity, you will see that these two, SO diffusivity and radio diffusivity, you will see that in a point meter, when you switch these two, there will be a huge difference. That means here you have high anisotropy. Along the fiber, that's higher. Across the fiber, that's lower. And if you look at the gray meter, it doesn't really matter because it's all restricted at all direction. 
And in the ventricle, it also doesn't make much of a difference in terms of the SO diversity of radio because it's all free at all direction. So in this switching between these two maps, you could figure out, okay, where is isotropic restricted, meaning it's gray matter, that's what you like here or here. Or either it's isotropic, but not restricted, meaning that they're in a ventricle, or it's restricted in certain directions, but not in, in another, then it's an isotropic in a white matter. So essentially, most of the MRI metrics can be categorized into these three domains and to detecting all different tissue types. So similarly, it's for example, for the GQI, QA is also for an isotropy, so it's higher in a white matter. And there are also DTI major also computed alongside with GQ, GQI, so it's also from DTI data. But here, this one ISO is mean the isotropic diffusion, excluding free water. So you see here is enhancing the gray matter. So ISO here, because we exclude the B zeros. There is more high, is higher value in, in the gray matter regions. Ideally, if you use RDI, you will give the same. So the difference between RDI and ISO is the ISO will just get all the, it's not telling the difference between restricted or non-restricted. As long as it's isotropic, then you'll be computed here. And here, since we excluded the B0 and all, all the DWI has a much higher, or like just a, around 1,000, so it will enhance the gray matter. But if you have multiple B value, then the reconstruction allow you to tell the difference between restricted and non-restricted. So the RDI and NRDI will tell you restricted and non-restricted. But here, it's not going to tell you because we only have one B value. The reason is like, if you have just one B value, Restricted diffusion and non-restricted diffusion are mixture together. And if you want to tell the difference between restricted diffusion and non-restricted diffusion, you need at least two B value, the more the better. So the B value, you can imagine, you can imagine it's like a bandwidth of detecting the diffusion. If you have multiple B value, then you are open to all the bandwidth. You can tell where is very restricted diffusion or is non-restricted diffusion. And that is why a lot of more advanced modeling method, they would require at least two B value. So if you check out here, if you, you will find a more advanced methods, they would require quantifying restricted, restricted diffusion, and then would, they will require more B values here. Um, whereas the most simple models is like DTI just only need one B value. So those are the vessel based matrices. Still there's another matrices this for microscopic, for example, the, the, for getting from the entire fiber track, we can quantify the lens, diameter, or the geometry. Um, in the past, these shape matrices are often ignored. Um, some people may just is to pour the diameter or the volume. Um, in DSS Studio, there's a way we could report like more advanced, like like the end area, like the irregularity, uh, different shape measures, and we will show how to do it in the hands-on part. So let's have some hands-on session about the doing the region-based analysis and track-based analysis. So it's here we just use GQI for example. So open the GQI fit file, the GQI fit file. The reason we use GQI fit file is like in the reconstruction, the routine also compute DTI for you. And then the way we could analyze, for example, if you want, if you have a region and want to know what's the average value of QA or FA, for example, I just draw a region here. And you can go to a region menu and click statistic. Then you will compute all the matrices average within. So you see here, there are QA, there are 
I saw all the value within. You can use the template. So once you click it, you will run through a normalization. Then you can bring the template region. And the same here, for example, I you set all the best of gang graph regions. And I can go to region menu, statistics. And here I can save it as a test file or just copy to clipboard. Open, open to clipboard and I can just paste it in a Excel sheet. So you can see here for each of the regions coming in as a column and all the QA values coming in. So for this scan, we got all different value for each of the regions. I see a question if a poor acquisition data sets um, refer to QI due to more resident years. That's that's the reason I, I would I would choose uh, GQI. So this is a region-based analysis. Um, register forward, just open a fit file, set a region, and use region statistic. And we can do the same on track. So for example, in this data set, I would say, okay, instead of using a region, I use a track, yes. For example, I just track map the aqua fasciculus, like what we did in week one or week two. Similarly, once we got a track, go to track and statistics. You can copy the clipboard and then open it in Excel, paste it to Excel, or you could just like save it to an, a test file and, and uh, analyze it here. So here's just an example of aqua fasciculars. You see that here underneath, those are the matrices along uh, average from the pathway. And on the top are the main macroscopic. So special things about this track analysis is, in DSS Studio is include microscopic and macroscopic. So you could uh, complete a study uh, combining microscopic feature and macroscopic feature. But one important thing about this one is like those microscopic feature depending on the geometry. So if you want to use this, you have to use GQI, not QSDR. Because if you use QSDR, then all the subject brain be normalized to a sense space. Then a lot of volume metrics, area metrics, dense metrics will be normalized as well and be affected. So to get those quantified, compare those track features, you need to do it in the subject space, which use GQI. Once you use QSDR to MNI space, then those shape matrices uh, is not going to be used. Yes, for sure. And here you can see that DTI phase here. So you can also get DTI matrices. And most importantly, if you use um, the DKI ketosis, if you use Nadi, you can also analyze it all together and I could show you how to do it. So before then, there's one function I mentioned previously that you could export like those matrices as a nifty file. So if say, for example, you could save the QA as a nifty file. If you can export it, then you can import it back. So I mentioned this because if you have, um, you want to process data using Nardi, then what you could do is that uh, once you process the data, you can save naughty matrices as a nifty file and then insert it back in DSS Studio. So to do it, let me show how to do it. Go to the list. Let me find the save photo. For example, this one is a QA I save, is ported from DSS Studio. And let's make it, I say, um, for example, if you have like a DKI also exported like this nifty file, I just use this as an example. And then, and there will be DKI value or either Nardi or anything. Then in DSS Studio, you can use those matrices from different model or different tool. The way to do it is, first of all, you open the fit file 
and you can insert those external matrices using slices, insert outer image. So slice, insert outer images. Make sure that this matrix is also in the subject space if you use GQI. So click on it. You say it needs alignment. So this means that do you, sometimes, a lot of time you will need to rotate the image bottom. Um, so most of the time I will just click yes. So once you insert it, you will see that the inserted bottom will be listed at the bottom. And you can view it. And once this is included, then you can you apply the same. So for the region statistics, you show this DKI showing up. If you run the fiber tracking and track statistics, then you also see the DKI matrices coming up. So for example, the track, you can go to the statistic. And here's the DKI showing up. So, he, and here it could be like matrices from PET scan, from any kind of modeling method, from different modality. You can just insert those slides here and then this is do a ticket and then analyze it as an integral part. So, this will be very useful. I say some of the model you're really interested in, like for the Nadi. And just download another MATLAB toolbox, process it to your DWI, and then get the ISO, ODI, NDI, all the matrices, save as a native file, and then insert it and insert them back into DSS Studio's fifth file. And then you will continue with region based analysis or a trick based analysis. So I mentioned the insert auto modality. And this, still there's another way. Um, if you want this analyzing the along track profiles to show how to do it. So there's a tool um, named AFQ um, is very, it's often used to analyze the track profile from one end to another end. So for example, here, if I want to analyze like the QA value from one side to another side. So here I just not just here, just showing the local QA value. But what I could do is go to the track menu and there is a track profile allow you to quantify, let's say in the Y direction, what's the Q, QA value we see there's lower to higher, lower to higher. So it's corresponding to from here to here. So you could have, X, Y, Z direction or along fiber orientation. So this will be one side to another side. You will need to figure out which one is this one side, another one is another side. Um, and the way to figure out is that you could cut the fiber and then see how it looks like. For example, you could still you could cut it and then set it another side of it and do the same. So combined with track editing and all the things, you can get all the profile at different segments. So that it's more like comb combining all different methods all together, including track editing, including inserting new slices to get the results you wanted. So it's all flexibility here. And those functions, either including region-based analysis, track-based analysis, or this track profile, you can Call it from command line so you can apply it to all the subjects. The so three means that briefly go through group wise region analysis using kinetometry database. So here's like a kinetometry database. Like we, once we get the QSDR reconstruction, then all the subjects literally they are in the same space. So say if we want to analyze the same region across all subjects, that's also the easy shortcuts in DSS Studio is creating a kind of topic database. So this database is aggregating all subjects fit file into just one file. So the sample you download here, if you go to here, there will be a kind of topic database. 
For example, here is a CMU two millimeter chromatography database in this link. You can download it. And then this database is also a FIT file, but this FIT file is not just a simple FIT, simple FIT file. It includes the FIT file for all the subjects aggregating from 60 subjects. So there could be hundreds of subjects aggregating into just one file, or either any kind of value could be hundreds or even thousands of subjects. And this is created from QSDR because as, we, as I mentioned, a QSDR already get all the data into a sense space. And once everything is in the sense space, the analysis will be much easier. So let me demonstrate it here. The data I just downloaded, it's called, has, it's a fit file, but you will see here is the extension of the DB. So this was created using the, um, the chronotometry pipeline. So it's fo it is following the, the step C1 aggregate fit file to create a chronotometry database. So just let you, just open this database and let you see how it looks like. So this bring out the, a database content. So it includes several subjects. And you see that since all of them are in the same space, most of us also are aggregated together. So there's a 60 subjects here. And then you can open this in step T3. And once you open this step T3, you can draw a region and you go to region statistics. Now the statistic will be computed across all the subjects. So you see here subject, each of subjects QA being this tier, let me copy the curve for, and then paste it here. So for simple region-based or track-based analysis, you could just kill all those all the subjects analysis in one shot. So here's just a QA value then for all the subjects. So one limitation of this database is that it can only include one matrix at one time. So this database is created using the mean QA value, the QA value. So that's the mean QA of the region I just draw here. So this database is not a way you could just aggregate all the subjects with in, into the same space, into just one file, and you can just draw a region or draw a track using region statistic or track statistic to get the results. So this all concludes today's course, and I will also recommend you to also go through today's assignments, um, which will get you more understanding of what the region-based analysis, track-based analysis looks like. You can also create a chromatography database following those steps and then to, to experiment what it looks like using this SCA2 data sets and then look at the, the Pong's region zero bit decrease and that's also be found here. So I will conclude the course here. If you have questions, feel free to stay or you will just feel free to log off. And thanks for your participation. If you have questions or data that I need to check, feel free to stay. I will stay for another half an hour. If you don't have a control group, then you, you would need a correlational tractography, which will be the week seven. So you will compare across the patients, uh, say for example, correlate patients uh, neuropsych and see which pathway associate with specific neuroscience. So it's like, uh, kind of, you also go through the chronotology analysis, yes. You also create a chronotology database and then go and then use correlational tractography to test it. Yes.
Any questions here? So the question here, if you have a specific small region, um, what you could consider is um, smaller voxel size, so higher spatial resolution, and only have limited slides cover that region, so we don't have a long scanning time. But here the SNR will be a critical issue. We need to have a trade-off between spatial resolution and, and the SNR. So in one study I participated, they would like to look at the Salamis. So what I did is that they acquired not the SL size, but the sagittal size just cover that region. And then really having like a high spatial resolution, but lower B value. Because if you have a higher spatial resolution, yes, and not drop a lot. So you cannot afford with high B value. So B value may, may need to be lower and it may be at most like a thousand. And it allow you to focus on that region. So that's one, one trick to do that. Instead of scan the whole brain, you can just focus, set that aside to cover the specific region of the target. Any questions here? I see here, if you want to have an FA value of sync to learn, should we use an atlas? You could do either way. Um, there are two ways to do it. Say, for example, if you create the chromatometry database from your subjects like this one, a simple way to do it is sync to learn is much easier because most subject has the same location. It's not like after fascicular, some maybe have different coverage. So it also depends on whether there's a lot of individual difference or a pathway for sync to learn. Uh, there's not many really individual difference. So you can use just a template here. So singular left, right, include both in. And once those singular regions coming in, you can just go through region statistic. That's one way. Or you could just track it here in the template space. So there's different component of the singulum. You can track each of them or set that a component you want it track and you use track statistic. And still other way is that you can do the same for using GQI for each subject, but you would need to write like a um, carbonite script to go through each, each of the subject and then aggregate the result afterward. They may not give you the same results, um, because say uh, the location may be not identical. So I would say the results will not be the same, but the conclusion should be consistent. For example, if you will you con control and patient have a substantial difference, then both methods should um, point to the same results. For example, the, the assignment, the SCA2 data set, the difference are located in the pongs, and if you use G either region-based analysis or track-based analysis, they will still give you the same results, provided that the result is substantial enough. Um, but if you use such difference or the effect size is small, then probably track-specific analysis will be more well-defined. Because a region analysis, those regions may be started off or including other related other background regions, adding you a lot of variance, reduces the effect size. So I would say that the choice depends on your effect size and then uh, which method fit the context. Also depend on which fiber trick you're looking at.
I see your questions. Well, we'll come to any questions. Um, as long as it's a diffusion MI, or just MI, it's still within topic. So in vivo animal skin are very challenging. I I personally don't have a good recommendations. EPI methods often not giving you good results. Um, so probably you don't want to use EPI on live animal. Um, there are other ways to do it, not just num EPI. Um, but honestly speaking, I don't have a good recommendation because it's very tough. I have I rarely see a good able to do very good or high resolution animal scan, especially as mine. The, the size is like tiny, small one. So we really need to have a high field scanner um, for live animal and also very good coil. Um, they always distortion. You could still use EPI, but distortion will kill you. Um, so it's never been easy, I would say. Uh, now, <clears throat> I have two questions. Can I share the screen so that you sure, can Sure, sure thing. Let me, let me uh, stop my sharing. It's sick. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yeah, the first question will be, I have used uh, your demo data, the, the sub-01, the run two, to use it uh, after the edit correction. Then I have run the DTI model fitting. Then I got uh, the, the sample or representative images like this. Do you think that this kind of photography quality is okay or not? No, I, th I think that there's, there's a signal problem here. The corrections, um, even though we try to do the do it, but I don't think the quality is good enough. It that's the maybe there's a lot of motion. But the thing is, I have followed the, the for example the default pipeline to do it, but now I got this kind of uh, image with I mean I would say it's image. still usable, but the quality is still not very good. I would say you uh, mean the raw image quality? Yes. Yeah, um, even though you follow all the step preprocessing, all the things, but doesn't really guarantee it will, if there's a lot of motion, if there are a lot of artifacts or either there are acquisition issues. So for this one, I could still see the fiber orientations is okay, but the FA map, if you look at this FA map and the FA map, the, from the example we see today, you will see that's the gray, gray white matter contrast is much lower and a mm -hmm. lot of speckle. So usually this indicate there are signal dropout, another quality problem. So either mm -hmm. you can try um, different preprocessing or not using any preprocessing, see which one's better. Um, but depending on the anisotropy map, my first impression is that the data quality is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, according to your experience, for example, um, if we have like 200 or 300 DWR data, I mean, for this kind of issue, I think it would be not very rare, but uh, how can we fix this? Do we check all the data one by one after the pre-processing? It will be the quality check at the beginning of uh, today's course. Uh, in the assignment, I just showed once you create all the SRC file, you can put it in the a folder. Mm -hmm. Then you can use step T1A quality check to get a screen of all the subjects. And this has to point out which subject having a problem here, and you can drop them or check any in specific. And the second question would be, uh, for example, the, the region of interest Although we can use, uh, I mean, the built-in atlas, so that the the region can be uh, registered or linearly into the subjective space. <clears throat> but for example, if we have our own segmented, uh, for example, the, the, the telomeres or the basal ganglia area, yes. it, and um, I mean, uh, I, I think the the I mean the manually or automatically. Automatically uh, segmented 
uh, telomeres or second basal ganglia area will be more precise than right. using the atlas area, right? You're right. You're right. Yeah. Mm. If that's the case, then you can get a better. Yeah. The, for me, I would first try the atlas because it's easier to do. And if you still get the same result, even though the effect size is smaller, just mm -hmm. because there is a misalignment, that's still okay. Um, mm -hmm. But if your effect size is already very small, or either the region you are going to look at is already very small, that you, you need, really need to make sure that it's located at the right location, then some manual drawing will, will be needed. Mm, okay. And uh, maybe uh, the third uh, manual question could be, uh, I think the 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 assignment in the uh, the the third week for the third week you have the assignment. For example, you are recommended uh, for us to do a fiber tracking to the very small nucleus. Yeah. Yes. And uh, can you maybe quickly show a? I mean, uh, one example for us. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. I can show you how to do that. Um, <clears throat> you can stop your screen sharing so I can stop mine. Yes. yes. So this is assignment that you can see that a lot of small nuclei here and then mm. just download the one millimeter fit file. It take a while. Um, yeah, because uh, according to the instructions of the manual, it seems that we needed to use the, the type, like a terminative. Well, it depends. Yeah, because- I, I would mean, say if you get the track you wanted, then it's a good way. You don't really need to strictly follow what I did. No, okay. So let's look at the one specifies number five. So you go from here and somehow somewhere and then go to a occipital lobe. So it's, you can see here, number five may be around here. Mm -hmm. So I can draw like a region. Just say, for example, like this one. And then I would just first try to just use it in our eye and see how it goes. Yes. I'll restore rendering settings. And for, I would just use line. So it's make things easier. So you see that there is some track that go anterior to posterior. Mm -hmm. So I was just delete those, this is not the one I wanted first. It did like this one. And then I will redo it again. This time I would just I use track to ROI. But here I just use C. So instead of using whole brain seeding, I use those regions as a seeding point. And I can smooth those regions, dilate it, smooth, dilate it, and then run it again. So here, what I could do is I can use maybe like a, another ROI in the occipital lobe. With a bucket. See if I can go V1. V1 on the right. And I, mean, and I can consider dilated a bit. Oh, not yet. So make it an RI.
And this one is like going through from here to here. So it's not exactly the same as what it draw, but it's like going from here to here. Yep. So I would say there's no, there's just different tools and different way. Um, how I see uh, endpoint, use all the combination to get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, when you uh, convert the tract into RI, but uh, how can we decide the appropriate uh, like extent to dilate or erode? No, well, it 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 depends on your anatomical understanding. Mm -hmm. It's try to try. There's no correct answer, I would say. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Okay, let me look at, there's another question in the chat. Also got a question is uh, to compare three pathological group, okay, with their neuropsych, what's your advice? Um, <clears throat> so for three pathological groups, one, <clears throat> one solution is like, <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, here, you may have subject one, uh, you may have group that, uh, maybe I use this cell to explain. So this will be involved like a regression modeling problem. You have group like, you may have something like this group, Right, and some may be A, B, A, B, B, C, I, B, C, I, B, B, F, T, B, something like this one. And this will be subject one, subject two, then blah, 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 to subject M. And you may, you may have neural side, maybe like a one, five, like this. <clears throat> And also in the regression model. So here, correlation stratigraphy, the key is running a linear regression. And of course here for groups, if you have three groups, it's not able to let you run a linear regression because I, this is not a linear relation between those groups. So the way to do it is we call it to study the fixed, error, fixed effect is you should have three variable, A, B, PCI, so some subject may be one, one, and this one, 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 and this will be zero, zero, zero. So this will study the fixed effect of each group. And you can study neural side and still consider a, D, D, C, I, B, B, F, T, D. And of course you may have age, FS, something like this one. So I will try this one and then look at the effects of neural sites and consider all variable all together. But here you only study the fixed effect, not the random effect, um, and see if you get good results. The, the difference between fixed effect and random effects is like, uh, in the linear model, they, they constitute different behavior in the regression. Um, if your effect size is good enough, it really doesn't matter. But you, if your effect size is small, then this will make a difference. Unfortunately, in DSS Studio's correlation uh, stratigraphy, we can only use this approach to study the fixed effect. Did I answer your question here? So you, you need to have this kind of demographic. So when you run the correlation of stratigraphy, you can get a correct result. In the regression model, including AD, DCI, and this, and this. And of course, you can study the difference. Now in the AD group, some chart may be decreased or study specific groups. Yeah. Questions here?
If there is no questions, I, um, I'm going to end today's session here. Um, thanks for your participation. Thank you. See you next week.